And finally, Linda said, Sir. I was glad that she said, Sir. She said, Sir, have I done something wrong? And he looked at her and he said, Ma'am, when people drive like you have been driving, they are usually inebriated. Now, wouldn't that be neat in the paper? Preacher's wife, DWI, <laughs> without anything to drink. But we did eventually make it home. Uh, you know, I know some of you don't like humor in the pulpit, but let me tell you something. God has a sense of humor. Maybe we need a little bit of humor. I, I don't go for this uh, sermon filled with foolishness. I don't like that either. But you know, a little levity doesn't hurt. God's got a sense of humor. I can prove to you God has a sense of humor. I can prove it. Look at this. God's got a sense of humor. He wouldn't have made something like this if He didn't. As we start this morning, now I want to make something clear. Hey, Steve, what do you think of the elders of Portland? Well, let me tell you what I think. I don't agree with every decision that they make. I don't agree with every decision that I make. But let me tell you something. They are four Christian men who love the truth. I wish no harm to any of them. I wish the best for them and their precious families. You don't need to ask me that again because that's my final answer. Whatever the future holds, that's my answer. And you think about this. Wasn't it kind of our four elders to say, Hey, Steve, we're going to take care of you. Wasn't that kind? That's kindness. And I appreciate it. Appreciate these beautiful flowers that my wife arranged last week. She did a, did a beautiful job. If you look at Job 14, 1 and 2, all of us who have lived very long on this earth, we know Oh wait, I forgot one thing. One more thing. Many preachers that I know, when they preach their last few sermons, they think back over all the years of all the times they think they've been offended or unjustly treated. And then their last few sermons, they just blast everybody out of the pulpit. Let me tell you what I think about that. If you didn't have the guts to say it before, why do you take advantage of it on your last few sermons? And people, it gets to the point, people, every time somebody walks, in, the preacher walks in the pulpit, people are on the edge, who's he going to blast today? That's not happening here. That's not happening here. Back to Job 14, 1 and 2. All of us who have lived very long on this earth, we have found that it is filled with trials and difficulties. Even people who are trying to live right 
and godly lives often have tremendous trials. This man Job was like that. He lived a beautiful life. He stood against evil. He stood for God. He suffered horribly. And this was his view of life in Job 14, 1 and 2. Man that is born of woman is a few days. I get that. And full of trouble. He is cut down like a flower. Verse 2. And like a shadow of he, like a shadow, he fleeth away. Life is filled with difficulties. And what nearly all of us do when, when we're going through, we have this question. Why? Well, Job had that question. Why? I lived for God my whole life. Why? Let me tell you something. Even though the book of Job is inspired and it records everything correctly, Job wasn't thinking right. He wasn't hitting on all eight cylinders. That's not the right question. Our Creator knows everything. Everything that's ever been said, everything that's been done. He knows all the past. He knows all the present. He knows all the future. And what do we know? Nothing. Those of us who think we know something, we've already been shot out of the tub. We don't know anything. And so we are going to question a Creator. We are going to question Him when we have so little information. What I'm saying is we don't have enough information to question Him. Linda and I have been through what we thought was some pretty rough times. This ain't the first time we've been down this road. And let me tell you something. We have never gone hungry. My sweet little children never went hungry. They had some ugly things said to them. Someday they might get over it. They never went hungry. We always had a roof over our head. We never had what our brethren had. But we had enough. We had plenty. And we were rich compared to the rest of the world. Sometimes we suffered because I chose to defend God's truth and offend some weak brother. But let me tell you something. All of those times of anxiety, all of those times of pain were worth the price to be able to stand up and preach exactly what the Bible says was all worth it. I've been preaching since 1970. I never thought I would make it that long. My dad told me the first time he came to hear me preach. And he was sober. And he said to me, is this what you intend to do the rest of your life? Yes, sir. He said, well, your lifespan will go to about 30. 
He said, the church will not put up with the way you preach. He said, you're a dinosaur. You need to get up with the times. He would be surprised. I'm still here. How God has blessed me to get to preach His unsearchable Word for all these years. Me and Linda have bitten our fingernails a couple of times. But let me tell you something, that's nothing like Jesus had to suffer. We haven't had to suffer anything like the apostles. We haven't had to hurt anything like the early church. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Because there's always going to be weak brethren who can't take it, and God knew that. And so He warned us, look, here's what you got. Matthew 5, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name. Rejoice! Don't have pity parties. He says to us, Rejoice and be exceeding glad for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. When someone says to me when I'm preaching in a congregation and they say, well, uh, it's going good. And I say, well, what do you mean it's going good? Hasn't been any complaints. I don't usually say anything out loud, but I think that doesn't mean it's going good. If you are going to stand for what God stands for, there are going to be complaints. But what is a complaint compared to being burned on a stake? What is a weak, ungodly person that's supposed to be a member of the church saying some little cute thing to you? What is that compared to being crucified on a cross? 1 Peter 4.16 If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this name. Anytime the church suffers, for standing for God. He said, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Hold up your head. You're honoring God. Well, why do these difficulties come? If we're trying to do right, if we're trying to serve God, why do all of us have these difficulties? Sometimes we have tribulations that I mean just knock the breath out, and it don't take much to knock the breath out of me because there ain't much there to start with. But sometimes we have things just knock the breath out of us and almost destroy us, and we say, I can't go on, I can't stand this. Why? The book of Job is a classic book on suffering. And in all those chapters, God never answered why. If He answered us, we probably wouldn't understand it. If He says, this is why you're going through this, this is why you're going through this, it'd probably be so far above our heads, it'd be like another language. What I'm telling you is, we don't know why. We don't know. Does that mean we can know nothing? Absolutely not. 
God has told us some wonderful things in the Bible to sustain us, to get us through. What do we know? We know God loves us. Romans 5, 6. When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but for adventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Being therefore now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. 1 John 3, verse 16, Hereby we perceive the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. How do we know? He said, you understand it because look what He did. John 10, 18, Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down. May His love and true concern comfort us May it make us stronger. May it cause us to face the issues of life, whatever comes. May His love make us so strong and courageous. What do we know? What do we know when tribulation comes? We know that it's not always bad. You know how we look at it? Oh, this is so terrible, I can't go through another minute. I just can't handle another second. And we look at it in a negative way. How negative we are about tribulation. I mean, I'm not saying nobody's sitting around saying, wow, isn't this wonderful? With some silly little stupid grin on their face. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a serenity in your soul. A calmness in your soul that whatever happens, God is with you. God loves you. Suffering is not negative. Look at James 1, 2, and 3. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you, when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Now, in the original language, what he's saying in James 1, 2, and 3 Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various tribulations. Count it joy. Why? How could you count it joy? That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Doesn't feel very joyful to me. Does it to you? Seem like a pretty bad deal to me. That's the way we look at it. But we need to look at it like God looks at it. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because that produces perseverance. And if you don't have perseverance, you ain't going to heaven. And trials and tribulations and heartaches help us develop character and perseverance. Is that negative? 
James 1.12 Blessed is the man that is endure temptation, for when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Psalm 119 71 or 72, somewhere in there. Just start in verse 1, you'll get it. I think it's 72. In thy word do I put my trust. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good. Now that doesn't mean that everything happens to you is good. Some things that happen to you are unjust and unfair and ungodly. That doesn't mean that they're good. It's not what he's saying. But look what he says. We know that all things work together for good. Even negative things. For those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to His purpose, God can take a tragedy in your life and turn it into something beautiful. How does He do that? He's God. I don't know how He does it. I don't care how He does it. I believe it. He can take the greatest tragedy that you can imagine in your life and bring something good out of it and make you a better person. Hebrews 12, 5-11 says God disciplines us and of course none of us as children or adults enjoy discipline. I mean, my boys, of course, I I believed in spanking them. And I don't mean like that. I mean spanking them. But I never remember them saying, Daddy, would you hit me just one more time? Because discipline doesn't seem pleasant when you're going through it. And that's what the Hebrew writer is telling us. But we have a God who is all knowledgeable and knows what He's doing. And He is in control. And He is disciplining us to make us more holy. To make us more righteous. That's how you can thank God for tribulations. It's making you more holy. We sing a song about help to make me more holy. Well, that's the way he does it. Well, I don't like that way. Well, you're in the wrong religion then because that's the way he does it. We don't understand it. We don't comprehend it. He's so much smarter than us. There's no way. But we believe it. We believe it. So what do we know? We don't know all the answers why. We don't know. If you sit around waiting for it, you ain't going to get it. You're not going to get the answers. There's too much out there we don't know. So you're not going to get the answers. You're not going to find out why. But you know the Lord loves you. And you know that He said in Romans 8, 30. One, if God be for us, who can be against us? We know He said in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, I'll never leave you. Never. I will never forsake you. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. That's in the Bible in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Read it sometime. It's beautiful. That's what we have. That's what we have in God. Romans 8, verse 18. 
when I consider all the sufferings of this present time, it is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. All the horrible things that happen to us, he said, when I consider all of it, it's not worthy to even be compared to what glory is going to belong to us. These promises sustain us. These promises make us strong. These promises make us not afraid of any human being. These promises help us to stand strong for God and to live for Him come what may. But you know, all of these beautiful things only belong to you if you're walking with God. Are you walking with God today? then all these beautiful things are yours. Are you not walking with God? You can forget it. None of this is yours. Walking with God only begins when we obey the gospel. Then it's a lifelong life of loving people, caring for people, doing everything you can to help others, sharing the gospel with them, doing everything you can to stand for truth. That's walking with God. You can begin right now.